All right, today we're going to talk about the federal budget. Basically, where does all the money go? So uh, in the next lecture, we'll talk about taxes, talk about paying your, um, paying your taxes and how the money goes into the government. And today we're going to talk about where does all the money go? So this will be sort of a broad overview of the federal budget, um, the sort of where does money get spent, um, a little bit about um, where it com comes in from, um, talk a little bit about the debt and deficit, and some a fair amount of long-term trends. Okay, so first I think we need some basic terms. Um, so one term is revenue, um, and this is money that comes into the government uh, via taxes and other means. Most of it's taxes, um, but there are some other like fees and, and whatnot where the government is able to generate revenue. Uh, outlays, and this is money the government spends. So big broad terms, revenue coming in, outlay, money going out. Uh, deficit, so the deficit is for any particular year, outlays minus revenue. So how much money is spent minus how much money comes in. So just as an example, um, in 2019, uh, the deficit was about a trillion dollars. Debt is the deficit added up over time. So our total debt, at least when I put this lecture together, was about $22.8 trillion. And sure it's more, you can uh, find a clock online where the uh, debt sort of just tricks up and up and up and up uh, every second. Um, mandatory spending, that's another term. Mandatory spending uh, is money that is automatically spent on programs like Social Security and Medicare. So you don't need legislation every year uh, for mandatory spending to happen. On the other hand, we have discretionary spending, um, and that's money that the government appropriates each year via legislation. So with discretionary spending, um, the, the Congress and the president have to pass a bill that says how the money is gonna be spent, and we'll, we'll talk about this. Do have a bonus term, uh, entitlements. So entitlements recently uh, have gotten a sort of bad rap. People say things like social security, that's not an entitlement. Um, I think what happens is, is this term entitlement um, has become synonymous maybe with things like um, welfare. Uh, this idea that um, you know, entitlements are a bad thing. Um, and in fact, I view it as the opposite. So I'll give you the definition. Um, and I'm going to give you a very specific one here that I'm going to read because I, I think it's important for people to see the, the, this definition. So entitlement, it's a federal program that requires payments to any person that meet the eligibility criteria established by law. So basically, as long as you qualify for a program, you get the money. Um, so entitlements constitute a binding obligation on the part of the federal government. Um, and eligible recipients have legal recourse if the obligation is not fulfilled. So the government has to uh, give you this money as long as you meet whatever criteria are established. So as an example uh, or examples, Social Security and some VA compensation, veterans compensation and some pensions are examples of entitlement programs. So Social Security is an entitlement program. Um, as long as you meet criteria, and there's sort of two broad parts, are you have to pay into the system via working um, a certain amount of time. Um, and then um, if you reach retirement age, um, you can start drawing on Social Security sometimes early at reduced benefits or full uh, retirement age. Um, and that's all just sort of laid on by formula. You get the money. Um, now, people, for some reason, think like calling something an entitlement means it's a bad thing, like you haven't earned it. Uh, but Social Security is an entitlement, um, and you've earned those funds. So the way I think about it is uh, you're entitled uh, to that money by law. There's nothing bad about this. Um, I argue with people on social media, and this is one I argue a lot, where people say, you know, Social Security is not an entitlement, or Medicare is not an entitlement, where, in fact, it's the opposite. They are entitlements. You're entitled to these things by law, as long as you meet criteria. And basically, it's um, either reaching a certain age and, and maybe some combination of paying in uh, as you work. So take home point, you want Social Security to be an entitlement program. If it was not, the government could say things like, uh, you know, you paid into Social Security, uh, but we're not going to pay out. Now, 
they can change the law. That's a possibility, right? The government can say things like, we're going to raise uh, the retirement age uh, or we're going to reduce the benefits for Social Security. But that means uh, the Congress and the president have to pass a law to do that. Uh, as it stands, um, you know, we know what the criteria are, they're relatively fixed. Um, and so we want Social Security to be an entitlement program, not something that some like bureaucrat can decide. Um, we'd rather have it be very clear from the beginning. So bonus term entitlement, it's a good thing, not a bad thing. Okay, so where does the money come from? Um, and we'll, we'll talk in the next lecture very specific about income taxes and how you do your taxes. And this is just gonna talk at some broad levels. Okay, so um, this is money. This is probably the last budget. Uh, I should say you're gonna see federal budgets talk about things like fiscal years versus calendar years. Um, fiscal years can be a little strange because they don't run from January to uh, December. I think the federal fiscal year starts in October. And that means it runs through um, the next September, I think that's right. Um, Oklahoma has its own fiscal year that starts uh, July 1 and runs to the end of June. So fiscal years sometimes are a little weird because they don't fall in calendar years, but don't worry about that. But if you see numbers and dates and they don't quite match up, it's, it's probably a fiscal year calendar year thing. Um, okay, so uh, broad, big picture, where does the federal uh, budget money come from? Uh, $1.7 trillion is income tax. Um, so that's individual income taxes that you and I pay. Um, 1.2 trillion is a payroll tax. And we talked about payroll tax in the last lecture when we looked at a paycheck. We'll talk about payroll tax um, in the next lecture. Uh, but this money um, is split between you and your employer uh, if you work for someone else. Um, it's roughly 12.45, something like that. Uh, 13%, sorry, uh, is the total. Um, but you, if you work for someone else, half of that amount comes from your paycheck and the other half comes from your employer pays it. I have this qualifier, uh, if you work for someone else, if you work for yourself, you're self-employed, um, or you're like you own the company, um, the someone else you work for is you, so you're required to pay sort of both halves, uh, you can call it both halves of the payroll tax. Anyway, so, um, a little less money from the income tax, but a lot of money, 1.2 trillion, um, comes from the payroll tax. So again, you know, you, there's this attitude of like, oh, 47% of the population doesn't pay taxes. If you work, you pay the payroll tax. And so this, this comes out of your paycheck automatically. Um, there's a little bit in sort of corporate income tax. So we get this idea of like, oh, businesses should pay more in taxes, and you could agree or disagree with that. Not a lot of money actually comes from corporate income taxes. The way the government generates revenue is businesses hire people, uh, those people make a wage, and then that wage is taxed. So there's a lot less of businesses paying taxes. So you can think of this idea, you, know, you say, oh, Amazon didn't pay any money in uh, taxes. Usually the reason for that is, is Amazon does make a lot of money. Um, a lot of that goes to you know, sort of the executives in, in Amazon. And, um, there's a lot of workers for Amazon that individually don't make a lot of money, but that adds up to a lot of money. Amazon also spends a lot of money investing. And when I say investing, I mean they're building warehouses, uh, they're buying, buying fleets of trucks, um, and you don't get taxed on investments. Uh, but anyways, not a large amount of the revenue generated uh, by the country and collected by the federal government comes from business taxes. Um, a lot of it comes from people like me and you taxes on our, our wages, either as income tax or and or the payroll tax. Um, and then there's these sort of other sources here that we don't really need to get into, although you can see estate and gift taxes are a very small amount of that. So the US doesn't collect much money in, in estate tax. Total $3.5 trillion. That's a big number. That is less than the amount we spend. Okay, outlays, money going out. Um, and outlays are divided into uh, sort of three broad categories. Uh, mandatory spending, we talked about this. This is uh, money that the government has to spend each year by law. Um, it includes Social Security, you can see here, is roughly one trillion. 
uh, Medicare, 644 billion. So uh, remember, so Social Security is, is mostly money, pension for retirees. They get a check every month. Uh, Medicare is health insurance for retirees or people who've uh, met a certain age, lived to a certain age. Uh, Medicaid, another 409 billion. Medicaid is traditionally for uh, healthcare for low income people. Uh, people kind of miss a little bit. Some of Medicaid also pays for nursing homes, um, which is usually uh, older people. Um, so older people can sort of draw off of both of these, both Medicare and Medicaid and also Social Security. Um, and there's this other category as well. Okay, so that's mandatory, $2.7 trillion. And again, this sort of just pays out automatically depending on um, how many people are sort of in the pot to collect Social Security. Um, Medicare, basically the federal government says we will reimburse doctors and, and hospitals for uh, a certain charge for whatever people need for their health care. Um, now, people do pay a little bit of premium for Medicare, but it's neither here nor there. Uh, but basically, how, however much um, health care the people who qualify for Medicare need, um, that's how, the, how much the federal government pays out. Uh, and Medicaid um, mostly works that way, too. Um, and so the, the, the Congress is not passing a bill every year saying how much we're going to pay in Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid. If they want to change these amounts, um, they need to pass a bill to change them uh, because it's automatic how much they're going to spend. And there's talk about sort of reforming some of these programs, but that'll take legislation. Uh, absent any reform, um, you know, th these amounts keep paying out and we'll see some of the trends over time. Uh, we have discretionary spending. And this is broken down into two broad categories, and we'll dig into some of the categories a little bit more. Um, but roughly half of discretionary spending is for defense, and half is non-defense. Um, and then another category is net interest, and that's 375 billion. Um, so that's interest on the debt, and we'll talk about how we finance debt a little, a little later in the lecture. Um, People have talked about how can we reduce the deficit, which is um, the difference between outlays and revenues in any particular year. Uh, and they say like, oh, you know, if we're not gonna retouch Social Security or Medicare, um, the only way to do it is through discretionary spending. As you can see, discretionary spending is a smaller part of the total budget. Um, so, and the deficit in this in any particular year, uh, this year looking forward, might be a trillion dollars. Um, so you can reduce the deficit, but if you want to eliminate it, uh, you basically need to eliminate all of discretionary spending, uh, or you could increase revenue. But um, just to get an idea of the size of the deficit, about a trillion dollars, relative to um, the amounts we spend, uh, it, it's a lot. So it's not an easy easy solution. Okay. Um, so break this down a little bit more about where um, the money gets spent. Now, I'm afraid my, my picture might cover this up, but healthcare programs, Medicare, Medicaid uh, is roughly 25% uh, of the spending. Uh, so that's a lot, right? Federal government spends 25%. Um, if we looked at this compared to other countries, the other countries would be a smaller number. So the way um, our government is set up. Um, actually, sorry, I, I have that wrong. That's probably not correct. So ignore that about other countries, but we're about 25%. Um, Social Security, another 23%. So this is, if you have these two categories together, it's roughly 50% um, goes for healthcare and Social Security. And most of Social Security is pensions. There is this disability insurance. Um, that's a small part of it. This next category, income security programs. Generally, what we think of as like welfare uh, is a small part of the total budget, right? So, and, and here's the, um, the 63 Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, SNAP. Uh, sometimes think of that as food stamps. It's even a smaller percentage of the income security program. So, you know, you get sort of people like, oh, if we could just, you know, I don't know, wean people off of federal assistance, we would solve our, our debt and deficit problems. It's clearly not true, right? You could, you could eliminate uh, this program altogether um, and it's altogether the income security programs is only 8%. So it's a small percentage. The big chunk of our budget um, is, especially on the mandatory side, is the um, 
healthcare and social security. And we have some other categories here. Okay, so we can look at too um, how much these uh, programs have increased over time. Um, and so in the top box here, uh, so sorry, we're looking at from 1999 to 2019 and change as a percentage of GDP. And so a lot of the numbers we're gonna look at today are as a percentage of GDP or gross domestic product, basically a measure of how big is our economy. And so that's economists like to think about our federal budget um, relative to the size of the economy. And so what this chart shows you is changes over time. Um, and so the biggest increase in our budget over time, at least the last 20 years, um, probably longer too, has been in healthcare. So the cost of Medicare and Medicaid has just uh, gone up a lot. Healthcare in the United States costs a lot of money. Um, that's sort of just, just the way it is. And we'll talk about this later on in the semester in a healthcare lecture. Um, but so that's a, a big part of our uh, budget. The you know, people running for president this year, they had different plans to how to provide healthcare. This is just Medicare and Medicaid, right? This is just for uh, one pot for elderly, uh, and one pot for low-income people. So this, this spending on healthcare does not include you know, probably healthcare for me and you. Uh, most of us um, are on either our employer's healthcare or maybe you're on your parents and your parents get it from their employer. So the biggest uh, increase in spending in our budget has been in these uh, healthcare programs. Social Security has increased over time. Um, both sides, the uh, old age and then the disability insurance. Uh, so that's the next uh, uh, biggest pot of money that's increased. Um, <clears throat> and that's because we have just more retirees. So this is the boomer generation is retiring and they're starting to, uh, or have started collecting their social security money. These other programs, income, income security, right? These are sort of traditional, again, we might think of them as welfare programs. The amount we've spent has basically remained the same relative to the size of the economy. So the dollar amount has, has gone up, but so is the size of the economy. When the economy is bigger, we generally bring in more revenue to the government. Um, you can look at some of these other programs, but the take home point here is the biggest increase to our federal budget has been in healthcare programs, followed by uh, pensions for uh, retirees. All right, um, so some information on discretionary spending. So it's basically, it's roughly split uh, in half between defense and non-defense. And this sort of is a deal that's worked out between the Democrats and the Republicans. Generally speaking, Republicans favor increased spending on military and Democrats um, favor increased spending on these sort of, I don't know, we call them domestic programs or the non-defense programs. Now, um, does this mean that like Republicans are war hawks and want to spend all this money? Like, eh, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, but I, I think uh, our representative Cole, uh, Tom Cole, is a good example here. Uh, so, you know, think about what's in his district. Tinker Air Force Base, um, and then he goes out to Lawton to pick up the um, military base down there. So he wants to have spending on the defense side because it gets back into those bases and and who works there? People, right? And those people live in Oklahoma. So it means jobs. So, you know, one way to think about defense spending is it's really just like a government jobs program. Um, and I don't mean to sort of like undersell what the military does, but like there's just a ton of money that gets spent on this. Uh, and some of it's jobs, this military personnel, but operation and maintenance, right? And so think about Tinker, that's a lot of what it does is maintenance on aircrafts. Um, and so that money sort of just gets funneled through the economy here in Oklahoma. Um, and that's, you know, if we're going to pay in, you might as well have it come back out to Oklahoma. Um, so that's why a lot of uh, Republicans, and they tend to have more bases in their district. Now, there is Republicans tend to be a little more hawkish, more in favor of military intervention than Democrats. Um, but in terms of like our government spending, you kind of want to think about this as, um, you know, big jobs program. Some of this defense money too just gets, gets, goes back to contractors who do things for the federal government too. Uh, but this other side here, this non-defense, um, so education, transportation, um, actually veterans gets pushed into the non-defense side. 
so when, when once you're out of the military, the spending is non-defense. Um, healthcare, so other healthcare, not uh, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, and some other categories are, are down here. And this other category, like we basically bunched tons of things that the government does into this smaller, you know, $136 billion category. Um, so, and these are just the broad categories of, of where things get spent, but on the discretionary side, you're gonna take on point 50-50 between defense and non-defense. And, and again, this is sort of like a deal the Democrats and Republicans have worked out is we're gonna spend equally or relatively equally within these categories. Um, what does this look like over time? Uh, this is discretionary spending again. Um, so the bottom of the chart starts in 1999, we ended in 2019. So a, a lot, but not all of the information we're gonna look at here, uh, the, the data unfortunately stop before today. And so we, we'll see, it'll be a couple slides that show this, a, a huge increase in spending uh, responding to the coronavirus crisis. Um, but a lot of the data is just, hasn't been put together yet. Government data usually lags. Um, so we start in 1999, end in 2019. Um, we see two recessions here. Uh, one sort of late, late 90s, early 2000s recession, 2001, I think. Um, and then the sort of great recession. Generally speaking, in recessions, governments start to spend more money. Um, the idea is they can stimulate the economy through spending money. Um, and we'll likely see another one if we were to look at this chart next year for the coronavirus. Um, so in this first recession, spending starts to increase. Um, both on defense and non-defense. You see the trends mostly move together. Um, they increase, and then we have the, you know, the Great Recession, and they start to shoot up by a lot once this Great Recession starts. Uh, this 2009 stimulus is in there. Um, and so what happens, when does this start to turn around? This is a little late in here because they started working through some of this, um, but in 2011, uh, they passed the Budget Control Act. Basically what happened here is Congress and the president agreed to cut spending in exchange for raising the debt ceiling. Probably weren't paying attention to this, but we had uh, for a while, you know, every number of months, we the uh, maybe six months, whatever, Congress would have to vote to raise the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling um, is a limit on how much the government can borrow to cover existing obligations. Uh, it needs to be increased periodically. So the government does not raise the debt ceiling. Uh, the government basically can't pay money that it owes to other people. And that'd be bad. I don't really know what would happen, but I think it would be bad. Because uh, people think of the federal government as a very sure investment. Um, so they will talk about how you um, fund the debt and the um, fund the debt in a, in a little bit. Um, but basically you need to vote on the debt ceiling to increase it. And this is kind of like a quirk. Other countries don't have this, but the way our laws work, um, basically we say, okay, we can spend, we can um, pay this much out to fund the debt. And once we hit that amount, we need to vote to raise it. This is not the same thing as saying we're going to um, spend more money on programs. So the government, when you think about the debt ceiling, has already said we want to spend this much money on programs. And then sometimes it takes another vote to say like, okay, it's all right to fund the debt side of this. It's kind of weird because they've already agreed to the programs. Anyways, 2011, uh, the um, Congress, the president sort of, they came to this deal that we're gonna decrease spending. Um, and these are the discretionary side. And we're gonna decrease by basically the same amount uh, in defense and non-defense. Some other parts of this, um, but, the big picture is they agree to decrease spending over the long long haul. And it's decrease in spending relative to GDP. And so the dollar amounts actually could go up, but because the economy grows, um, it, it looks like we're spending less money relative to the size of the economy. Uh, just some more uh, ways to think about the, the deficit or surplus. So this chart here looks at deficit, um, again, as a percentage of GDP. So deficit is, for any particular year, are we spending more or less than revenues? And so this starts in 1970, this chart, particular chart does. And you can see only in one short period of time, in 2000s, uh, when Bill Clinton's president, we actually run a surplus. And part of that was because there was an increase in taxes. And very quickly after this, uh, George, uh, President Bush is elected. Bush uh, cuts taxes and their deficit 
begins to grow. So our normal thing is to have a deficit every year. This, this figure is pre any sort of coronavirus spending. This figure looks at debt. So this is the accumulation of the deficit over time. Uh, and we see some peaks, uh, usually wars, civil war, we run up a huge debt, World War I, Great Depression, World War II, we have a huge debt, right? Almost 100% of the uh, GDP was, was debt. But then over time, we, sort of, we, we pay this off and partly by actually paying things back, but also the size of the economy grows. Um, so it looks like a huge debt at this point, um, but the economy is growing bigger. You can a way to think about maybe debt and the size of the economy is let's say uh, you take out a student loan now, you take out ten thousand dollars, but like uh, you don't really have a job, so it looks like a ton of money, right? But then hopefully you you graduate and then you get a job and your income goes up. So as your income goes up, that ten thousand dollars looks sort of like l less and less uh, amount of money. So if you're making uh, twenty thousand dollars. $10,000 in debt looks like a lot, but if you're making $100,000, it, it looks like less, it maybe feels a little bit like less. Uh, so anyways, uh, we've had a debt for almost the entire part of the country. I think the only time we paid it off was under maybe Andrew Jackson. So in a very short period of time, we had no debt. You can see how the projections are for this just to keep growing and growing. Uh, okay, now we start, this new one comes in and these uh, red lines shooting down here, 20, minus 20%, uh, 10%, 9.9%, .9%, uh, that's coronavirus, uh, right? The sort of the, the stimulus bills here that we passed are like a trillion dollars. That's huge. Actually, I think more than a trillion. Uh, that's huge. When you think about, remember back, we talked about how much revenue we brought in, uh, you know, maybe 25%, like 30%. Um, are, is getting spent. Now we need, I, I think we need the money. We could argue, was it well targeted? I think no, uh, but anyways, uh, our, our deficit is, is gonna go way up uh, and then our debt. So this last chart on this page, uh, sort of the lower line there uh, was sort of like what our actual uh, uh, debt was per year and then some projections moving forward. So you see like, okay, like it's gonna increase over time, but like not too bad, I guess. Uh, but the coronavirus, we have this big jump um, and then the same rate of increase. So just to give you an idea of like the size of that uh, stimulus package it was is huge um, relative to what we normally spend relative to the size of the economy. Again, was it needed? Yes. Targeted? Eh, it could be better. Uh, but just to give you an idea of how big it is. Another way to, to look at this. Um, so we have on, on the, the left part of this, um, the blue is sort of historical uh, debt, and the red is with the um, coronavirus in there. So the big one on the left, uh, or my left, is World War II, and then the red is coronavirus. So not quite the same size as World War II, which is right, the war that went on for several years, but pretty big. Um, it's worth taking a minute to think about how we actually finance the debt. So for a lot of people, the debt is just this like, I don't know, this big number and it's bad and something. Um, so it's worth thinking about how we, the government finances debt. You hear people say like, uh, we owe China all this money. Like, okay, yeah, we do owe, owe, sort of owe China a bunch of money, but it's not like China can say like, pay up now. Uh, there's terms to, to how this works. Okay. So when you and I go into debt, uh, usually like a bank loans us money and we pay uh, back the money over time with interest, right? So we go to the bank or use our credit card or something and take out a loan. The government goes into debt, we are the bank. So the situation sort of reverses itself. And uh, we is kind of broad here. Um, but what happens is, is the government sells bonds uh, that will be worth more in the future. So just an example, um, you could buy a, a five-year $100 bond for $90 today. So you basically go to the treasury, say, I want to buy, a, you, you would say, I want to buy a $100 bond. They say, okay, cost 90, give us $90. Then in five years, you've accumulated interest, the bond matures, you can cash in for $100. Seems like a decent deal. You don't think about inflation too much. 
Um, so usually the we in this case are like large institutional investors, maybe pension funds, uh, state and local governments, uh, and foreign governments. So foreign governments uh, do own a decent amount uh, of this debt. But the reason they do it is because it's a very safe investment. So say you had a bunch of money and you're like, uh, I need some returns on this, but I want it to be safe, guaranteed. So the federal government guarantees this debt. Right? They will not default on this. Back to the debt ceiling, if they do not vote to raise the debt ceiling for some reason, then they might start defaulting on this debt. Uh, and then we're no longer seen as a good investment. Because we're seen as a good investment, um, these big institutions, foreign governments will buy this debt. And this allows us to deficit spend each year as a government. So because this is seen as a guarantee, right? People say, okay, um, I'm willing to give $90 to get $100 in five years. Like, it's not a great deal. Um, but if you like put the $90 under your mattress, uh, it's worth even less because of inflation in the future. So you have this very safe guaranteed investment. Um, and so that, that's why it's important to raise the debt ceiling. So as I sort of said this already, sometimes you lose money due to inflation. So, you know, if I invested uh, $90 today, I collect $100 five years from now. Like, did I make any money? Like, is my purchasing power any better? Like, eh, probably not. But it's better than sort of sticking it in under the mattress. It's probably better than putting it in a savings account. The best savings account interest rates today are like 1% maybe. Now, sometimes actually these rates are worthless, basically zero, um, but people will still do it anyways again because it's safe why have we seen this huge increase in the deficit this particular year because of the coronavirus it's because of no one has jobs right so there's a, a, a huge uh loss of jobs and don't worry about like reading the numbers on here uh, i just thought this is the new york times headline when the job report was released uh this was the first one as, as part of the coronavirus crisis And so the, the bottom there is sort of the traditional um, job reports that come out once a month. And then this one was huge. So I think it's actually a great example of, of a layout in a newspaper and it really gets the point apart for, for a chart. Okay, um, a little bit more on, on, on debt. Um, we can also look at this in terms of who was president. And I think actually looking at this in terms of president is not necessarily the best way because the president does not decide by himself how much money we spend. Um, the president and the Congress decide how much money we spend. In fact, I think the Congress probably has more to say here than the president, probably because I study Congress, um, but I don't know. We like to, to blame presidents for things. We talked about in the last lecture how people expect too much from the government and put a lot of that pressure on the president. Anyway, so we sort of have this long slide down uh, from World War One, World War Two, sorry, uh, where the national debt as a percentage of the GDP decreases. Um, and then Reagan becomes president in 1980. And Reagan and the Congress agreed to this, um, really cut taxes. And we'll see later on how the top income tax rate has really declined over time. And that's caused less money to come into the government. Uh, they call this voodoo economics. Uh, I like the slide. Um, so we see a big increase in debt under Reagan and Bush. Clinton is the only president, and recently at least, where we've seen actually ran a surplus, and so the, the debt and deficit went down a little bit. Bush two comes in, puts in more tax cuts. So Clinton uh, raised taxes, and actually Bush one did too, raise taxes. Why is one time president? Um, Obama comes in, uh, debt increase. Part of that spent, well, it's all spending and taxes, but um, part of that is we had the Great Recession at the end of Bush II and the beginning of the Obama presidency, and then increases, uh, continues to increase under Trump. So Trump also cut his taxes. So we do, we're going to talk mostly about uh, um, money coming in here and spending. I'm sorry, we could talk mostly about spending. Um, later on, we'll talk about taxes, but you know, two sides of the debt are money coming in, which is taxes, and money going out, which is spending. So if you want to solve this problem, uh, you probably need a little bit of raising taxes and also spending less. But no one wants that. 
um, where, you know, why do we have this uh, deficit in debt? Um, and so basically, you know, like I said, we have uh, spending is more than revenues. Um, this chart here um, sort of looks, starting at the dashed line, is forward looking, and you can see the amount of money we're spending uh, increases a lot, while revenues like mostly stays the same. Um, whereas looking backwards before the dashed line, um, sometimes these, these lines actually overlap. We saw spending decrease, uh, but then it's slated to go back up again. Uh, where's most of the spending? We talked about this already. It's going to be in Social Security and healthcare programs, right? So all other non-interest spending um, basically is probably going to decline a little bit as percentage of GDP. And interest, because we're going to have a bigger debt, is going to increase. Now, something to keep in mind, everything past the dashed line here um, is projected. So the Congress and the President can change the law to make things look a little bit better. Will they do that? I don't know. Um, okay, we'll talk just for a few minutes here about potentially um, how to save Social Security. So if you looked at, remember the previous slide, um, Social Security is um, going to sort of increase our debt uh, because the government has to pay that. Um, but what's happened is, and we'll see it on this slide, is very soon, actually it's probably happened already, um, the amount of money that has to pay out by law um, it is more than the money that's coming in. So it's generally a bad thing. So how do we save Social Security? And so this would require changing the law, right? As I said before, this is mandatory spending. Um, it happens automatically unless we change the law. Discretionary spending, you have to pass a law every year to spend that money. So you can think about Social Security as on autopilot. So we'll walk through some examples. But so the top uh, darker green line is how much money we need, and the bottom line is money coming in. And so you don't want the top line to be higher than the lower line generally. So one option is raise the retirement age. So if we raise the retirement age to 70 for you can collect full benefits, you need less money. It doesn't, it doesn't get you all the way there, right? But so the dash line was the projection. We raise the retirement age to 70. It comes down. No, this is good and bad, right? Um, I don't know. I'm a professor. I can work until I'm 70, right? All I got to do is stand in front of the room. I can just replay these videos until I'm 70, right? And I'll probably still get paid. Right? Everyone's had uh, a person, you're like, wow, they really should retire, but you can't force us out as long as we show up and turn our grades in. Now, on the other hand, um, I can imagine someone who does manual labor or someone who works more in the service industry. That's not a job you can do until you're 70, uh, right? So this is not uh, the best best way to change things if there's people workers who can't work uh, until until they're 70 right they may just physically not be able to do it some you know ways to change a, a potential plan like this is say okay well some jobs you can work until you're 70 some jobs you can't um, but that's not how social security has worked it's basically said as long as you pay in a certain amount you can collect out a certain amount on the back end no matter what your job is um, now, what we do have is we have this now, and you could work into this program like raising the retirement age, is you can collect reduced benefits if you want to retire at an earlier age. So sometimes they, they say reduced full benefits. And a lot of people start collecting as soon as they can. Uh, what else can we do? So um, remember, Social Security is paid for by the payroll tax. It's not income tax, it's the payroll tax. Uh, we could increase the payroll tax by 1%. So it's 6.2% now. We could raise it to 7.2%. And that gets us a little bit more money coming in. Now, um, we're possibly in the middle of a payroll tax holiday, right? Trump signed the um, executive order that told the Treasury to stop collecting the payroll tax. It starts to get a little complicated because we actually probably still owe that uh, at the end of the tax year. I don't know. Who knows? Things are crazy now. Um, but you could increase the uh, payroll tax by 1% and there'll be more money coming in. Now you could also, um, the way the payroll tax works is you only pay that on your first $130,000 worth of income. So you pay in uh, the first $130,000 you make and then any money after that, you don't pay the 6.2% payroll tax. 
part of the reason we have this is um, <clears throat> the amount of money you collect in Social Security. So you, when when you retire, and the check is also capped, right? You don't get like you know some percent of your total income. There's a maximum amount that you can get. So that's sort of the the why we talk about we stop paying at $130,000. So what you could do is one change is uh, you pay in your first $130,000 and you stop paying. Then if you make $250,000, you start paying again. This difference between 250 and 130, sometimes called a donut hole, um, and this would bring a lot more money in. So imagine someone who makes a million dollars. Um, they would pay 6.2% on the first $130,000, nothing on the next 120 um, and then keep paying 6.2 percent on the rest of their income um, i think biden has a plan where we would start paying payroll tax again uh, so you pay first 130 and then at 400,000 you pay again um, and this 130 this this top number here it does go up a little bit each year um, sort of by law but anyways that would bring a lot more money in so if you have you know, wealthier people, you just have to pay more in payroll tax. You're not gonna get a, 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 another adjustment in social security though. Um, it's not like there's this gonna be this higher category in social security where you'd be able to collect more on the back end. I just pay more on, on, the, on the one end and you know, you're at the top level as everyone else. But anyways, it does bring in a lot more money. Um, so there's a couple different ways we can sort of save social security um, by collecting money when you're older, um, and then finding ways to bring more money in. And you can combine these. These are just some, some examples. You can find little tools on the internet that'll let you um, click through different options here. Okay, so how does the budget process work? Up until now, I've been a little vague and said things like Congress and the president have to work together to pass a law to, to like spend money. There is actually a, like a very well-defined budget process um, that the government usually ignores. But so we'll talk about it in theory and then we'll talk about it in practice. I will talk about this in kind of broad terms, um, a little more specific than Congress and the president have to pass a law. Um, but there are like very fine intricacies in this that uh, I probably don't understand them all. Um, and, and it would take like, I don't know, six years to explain everything. So we'll talk about in one slide kind of broad terms about the formal process in theory and then the formal budget process in practice. Um, these two things would probably make like a decent test question, right? T tell me the broad steps of the budget process in theory and then describe how it actually happens. Okay, so the first step is the president submits his budget requests or the president's budget to Congress in February of each year. And if you click on this link in your slide, you can see an actual um, presidential budget. It's really long, it's very detailed. Um, so it says how much to spend and where, um, how much we expect in revenue, and then also by law has to give a 10-year outlook on how much we expect to spend in certain areas, um, what we expect the, the debt and deficit to be. Um, there's other laws about sort of this 10-year window too that we won't get into. Um, but so the president goes first, submits the budget to Congress. Congress takes this and uses it as sort of the, the start. Um, and then they would pass what's called a budget resolution in April. So House and Senate both have budget committees. The budget committees set these broad spending targets in a few categories. So maybe like 10 or 12 categories. And this is for the discretionary side, right? Mandatory spending happens automatically. Budget resolutions, they don't actually have the force of law, but Congress agrees like we'll use these resolutions um, to guide our spending. Again, this is in theory. And then, so first the budget committees work, and then the House and Senate Appropriations Committees decide how to spend the money across basically thousands of categories. Um, and so each chamber has an Appropriations Committee, and they actually each have subcommittees that match up with the broad budget categories. A little bit more detail than we need, but um, I study this a little bit. Um, so the budget says what in terms of Congress in this process determines how much can we spend in broad categories and then appropriations says how much are we going to spend across thousands of categories. Um, you could, I don't know, maybe way to think about this is your parents, uh, they give you an allowance maybe when you're younger said okay here's some money, right, they're the, the budget committee, you know, you get this much money per week 
And then your appropriations committee, you're like, okay, I'm gonna buy like 12 packs of gum and like this and that and whatever. Um, so you're the appropriations committee. That might be a dumb analogy. I gave it anyways, and I'm not recording again. Um, and then the, all the appropriations bills are passed, House passes their own, Senate passes their own, then they might have conference committee. Um, so basically they have to agree to the same ones and then it's signed by the president. That's in theory. Practice, what happens is the president submits the budget late. So right, it's supposed to be in February, maybe gets it in on time, maybe a couple weeks late. Um, I like how we say like deadlines are important in the real world, except if you're like, I don't know, the president or Congress. And really the way to think about the budget is like, this is just the president's priorities. So the president submits the budget late, Congress mostly ignores it. And this could be in the same party, right? So President Trump might submit a budget and like McConnell and the Senate Democrat or Senate um, Republicans might be like, yeah, we're ignoring this because they can. Um, Congress doesn't pass a real budget resolution or any bud budget resolution at all. And basically each chamber decides how much to spend. And this this part here where they don't pass a budget resolution is usually if um, the chambers are of different parties or different party of the president. Um, the Congress might pass some of these specific appropriations bills, but what we've seen recently is Congress is pretty good at passing the defense appropriations bill, um, but the other ones they're not as good at. So they pass what's called a continuing resolution that says, uh, will continue to fund the government at the previous spending level. So at some point they had an agreement and they say, okay, we'll, uh, we'll continue spending at the same levels. So they have to pass something. So with the discretionary spending, if they pass nothing, the government can't spend any money on the discretionary side. So these continuing resolutions say like, all right, just pay the same amount until we work out a deal. But sometimes it takes a long time to work out that deal. So yeah, you have to pass something say the government can spend money or else there's a full or partial government shutdown and the government's, the parties try to blame each other. So we've had a couple of these like full or partial shutdowns. So for example, if they pass the, the defense appropriations bill and the president signs it, we can spend all that defense money. But if we don't pass say, I don't know, the transportation bill, we can't spend any money on transportation. So the two sides have to work out deals and they blame each other if the deal doesn't work out. So basically you can see this in practice is very different from reality. We can think about uh, in theory is like the cartoon version of the government and in practice is like the real version of the government. Think about those memes where like they have a million different like things in the wall and then the strings are going between it. Like that's how the legislative process really works. So um, there's a lot about the budget, a lot about debt and deficit. Um, but I think it's important to know like how the money is spent and that although you probably don't believe me, it was like pretty broad look at this. Uh, we can get into much more detail. If you wanna see much more detail, look at one of the president's budgets um, or look at um, an appropriations bill that's passed, passed by Congress. So federal budget, it's, it's like pretty complicated. You know, I skipped a ton of stuff, it's an intro class. I don't know how long this lecture is, probably longer than you want it to be. Um, but the government spends an incredible amount of money each year, right? Four trillion dollars, like that's a ton of money, it's crazy. Whenever I do a like um, legislative simulation in class, I always laugh when the students are like, well, I propose that we spend a million dollars on transportation. I'm like million dollars, that'll get you like a mile of road. Uh, gotta, gotta think big here. Um, most costs are relatively fixed, right? So this um, <clears throat> mandatory spending, healthcare, retirement funds, that's fixed. Um, so it makes it really hard to make cuts, right? If you wanna make cuts, you gotta start cutting defense um, and then some of these other programs. Um, long-term projections are not good uh, if you think the deficit matters. Now there's a school of thought that like the debt actually doesn't matter. There's another school of thought that it does. Sometimes it depends on your party and who's spending the money. Uh, but only real hope is to grow the economy. Um, so an easy way to grow the economy is to have more people in it spending and earning money. Uh, but our population growth in the U.S., and we won't talk about this too much this semester, but like it's really slowing down, right? So the people in America right now are having fewer children. Uh, you could, if you wanted to, increase immigration. Um, so more people in the country, right? And starting businesses, spending money, having jobs will help, help grow the economy. So there's a lot of moving parts to this. Uh, so anyways, I think, hope that was helpful to learn about how our budget works in pretty broad terms. Um, 
And so next week we'll talk about income taxes, uh, or next lecture, I guess, um, and how you as an individual pay into the system.